Worksheet's in the back. Anybody get a worksheet? Ever not get a worksheet? Hope I made enough. I think it did. We are having an interim class right now. Welcome to all of you who are here in the flesh and welcome to all of you who are online. We're studying tonight uh, two brothers in Christ who are mentioned in the New Testament. Similar names, Epaphroditus and Epaphras. And I'm making the assumption that I'm pronouncing those correctly. As I have said before, those guys aren't here to correct me, so who knows? <laughs> However, you ever think about the idea or the fact that, that we're going to meet these guys? We'll praise the Lord with them in glory one day. At any rate, we've got some reading to do before we answer the blanks or fill in the blanks answering the questions. So let's do that reading. We need Philippians uh, 2, 19 to 30 read. Who would like to do that to get us started tonight? Uh, I said this is an interim class. We're doing this tonight. This will be the last night, by the way, because next Wednesday, for those of you who do watch online, we will not be here next Wednesday. We will be meeting with three of our sister congregations in the area and worshiping um, collectively together. That is together, isn't it, collectively? You do that. We're, we do this at the end of the year, the last Wednesday of the year. We worship together to kind of sing out the old year and bring in the new. So that's where we'll be next week. And this class is kind of a fill-in because the first Wednesday in January, Lord willing, uh, Mike will be teaching Leviticus on Wednesday nights. I'm looking forward to that. So uh, got a lot planned, and this is the last night of this particular class. So have I talked long enough to give somebody the... Uh, Impetus to read that text, First or, uh, Philippians chapter 2, 19 to 30. All right, Paul will read that one. And then if somebody will pick up chapter 4, verses 15 to 18. Uh, Johnny, great, excellent. Let's, let's read, brothers. Thank you. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphrodites, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my needs. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord, with all joy and honor, and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. One through what? Uh, chapter <coughs> 4, 15 through 18. Three through. 15 through 18. Yes. Okay. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. Or even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from that Epaphroditus, what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Very good. Thank you guys for reading. Epaphroditus, the name means, anybody know what Epaphroditus means? Three words, charming, lovely, fascinating. Charming, lovely, Fascinating. How'd you, how'd you like to have that as a name, guys? 
Oh, there's Charming. Prince Charming, maybe? There's Mr. Fascination. Well, that, that was the name. That was a real name, and it was a common name. A lot of guys seem to have it. Uh, but it's from the goddess Aphrodite, who was the goddess of love and beauty. That's where the name came from. Paul planned, this is number one under that, Paul planned to eventually send who to the church at Philippi? Now, now this is in the text. I'm trying to get everything out of the text. There's only a couple of things that I'm really fishing hard to get, but this one was in the text. He wants to send Timothy. Well, why can't he send Timothy right now? Did you catch that? Go to chapter 1 and look at the very first verse. Okay, that, that's, that's why he wanted to send him, but why did he not send him? Maybe I didn't ask the question right. Paul and Timothy, what's he refer to him as in chapter 1, verse 1? Bond servants. Bond servants. Timothy was in jail with Paul when he wrote this. And so he was hoping to send Timothy, but he can't send him right now because he's a jailbird with me, basically is what he's saying. And he wanted to send him so that he might be apprised of their, the church's condition. What's going on with the church at Philippi? He wants to send Timothy back so he can get a good report about that. But he wouldn't send him until he knew how things would go with his, and this is by implication. It's not word for word in the text, how things would go with his imprisonment. He's in jail. He doesn't know how things are going to turn out. He is hoping to send Timothy to get him out of jail, and he's hoping to come himself. And I put by implication MJK. Those are my initials, by the way, because it doesn't say imprisonment, but I'm taking that to me, the meaning of the text. He mentions, Paul mentions, that they blanked Timothy well. They knew Timothy, or they know Timothy well, being familiar with his working with the apostle and that blank plans to come as well when he is able. Paul, Paul, when he gets out, when he is able, when he's free enough and well enough, he plans to come. <clears throat> Number two, in the meantime, so to speak, Paul was sending Epaphroditus, yeah, the guy we're, we're taking a look at. This is a class on folks who got it right and sometimes folks who got it wrong. Who did we talk about last week, by the way? Anybody even remember? Three guys, actually. What's that? Ahab was one of them. Micaiah. And one more king, king of Judah at the time. Jumping. Jehoshaphat, okay. There's your, everybody knows that. Like everybody knows Jehu drives furiously. Even Debbie Reynolds. I, I remember, because there was a movie about, Debbie Reynolds was in a bunch of movies, and she was in this movie. And that's one of the things she said. Why, Jehu drives furiously. Everybody knows that. All right. Paul was sending Epaphroditus, whom he called his blank, his brother, his fellow worker, and fellow soldier. Paul. Look up what the origination of jumping Jehoshaphat. And oh, you did? Apparently, it was an 1860s Cowboys novel. It was the first time somebody used that as an expression. <laughs> 18, 1860s, right in the middle of the war, man. Well, could have been at the end of the war, but jump. That's where it came from. First time it's on record, anyway, being used. Interesting. I'm, you know, I'm going to start counting on you for that kind of research every time things come up in classes. Just ask Paul. Find out from Paul. 
uh, Epaphroditus, whom he called his brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, and added that he was also Philippi's blank and blank to Paul. Messenger and minister. So Philippi sent this guy. He is their messenger, and he is ministering. He didn't just come and deliver the message. Okay, we're good now. I'm going to sit around. No, he ministered to Paul. He wrote that Epaphroditus blanked for the saints in Philippi. He longed for the saints in Philippi, being blank that they had heard that he was blank. Okay, so here's a guy who got sick. And instead of the sickness making him upset, he's distressed, he's upset because the brethren at Philippi have gotten word that he's been sick. Consider the context. How did word get around? Everything went very slowly. It was either by hand or by mouth. Obviously no telephones. There was a postal service. The Romans had a postal service. They had roads. And what did all roads do? All roads led to Rome. They, they had the Pax Romana. Sounds like a disease. But it was the Roman peace that they had established by conquering everybody and putting everybody into subjection. Nobody was willing to rise up uh, and, and do evil for the most part because Rome would put them down. And so the, all of that allowed for uh, correspondence to be sent back and forth. But if you had something that was really important, you would send your own messenger, and that's what the Church of Philippi did. They sent Epaphroditus. And he is sick. And Paul adds that he was not only sick, but he was sick blank blank. Unto death, he was really sick. I tend to think that we do better with medicine today than they would have in the first century. I could be totally wrong, but that's what I tend to think today. So I'm wondering what would it have been like to be in the first century and to be really sick Did he have a health care plan? Was he on Medicare? Uh, maybe he was a veteran and he could go to the VA hospital. You, know, you wonder about things like that. Luke was a physician, so there, there was that practice, and it was apparently an approved practice. But what would have been happening with Epaphroditus when he was sick unto death? All right, number three. Paul sent Epaphroditus blank. Where did he send him? He, he said, I'm not sending Timothy right now. I hope to send Timothy, and I hope to come myself, but right now I'm going to send Epaphroditus. So where is he sending Epaphroditus? Sending him home. He's sending him to Philippi, which is home. I, I put that in there because I want us to get this in our heads that this is a man firmly associated with the church at Philippi because he is a member there. And not only is he a member there, but, well, he is, he is their, their messenger. Uh, let's see. Where are we? Uh, Paul sent Epaphroditus home, not only for their sakes, and this one you'll kind of have to think like I do. That's scary, isn't it? Not only for their sakes, but also for blank, blank, that he himself would be blanked regarding their concern over their beloved messenger. And the blanks I would fill in with, but also for his own. Uh, I don't know if you if you caught it in the text, but there in chapter two, he said in verse twenty eight. Therefore, I have sent him, all the more eagerly. Paul eagerly sent him home, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. So Paul was concerned about them, and he wanted to send Epaphroditus home so he could be relieved, and I would put the word comforted. But also for his own 
that he himself would be comforted regarding their concern over their beloved messenger. His instructions to them included holding him, Epaphroditus, and those like him in blank, blank, because he blanked his life. Hold him in high regard. Hold this man in high You've got an apostle of Jesus Christ telling the church, hold this man in high regard because he did what? He risked his life. What's that? Yes, he aided Paul. But in this context, he specifically says, hold him in high regard because he, he risked his life. To complete, he risked his life to complete what was blank in your service to me. What was deficient? All that means is you had made an obligation and not yet fulfilled it, and he brought it and fulfilled it. That's what Epaphroditus did. So I asked the question, what did that last bit mean? And I just... So think about this. Here's a church, and, and Paul says of them, you know, nobody else helped me, but you guys helped me, and now they've helped him by sending this messenger with the financial gift. For the church in Philippi to send Epaphroditus with a substantial blank gift, what kind of a gift? Financial gift on this trip of around, how far do you think it was? About 600 miles. Some estimates are quite a bit higher. Which would take over three months as possible. I would have put two months, but we're still, and, and that's all relative. It's not an exact science how long it takes to travel. Maybe Epaphroditus was a distance runner, and that's just not included. Whereas he wouldn't have been named after Epaphrodite, he would have been named after Mercury. I'm just blowing smoke here, folks, on that one. They obviously saw him as a brother of great, and these three are totally mine, but what would you put in if, you, if you're thinking about, here's a guy, we're going we're to put a lot of money in his hand, and we're going to send him on a trip. It's going to take a couple of months, maybe three months. Who knows, maybe more than that. It's going to be a 600-mile journey. So he must be of great, what would you put in the first blank? Character is a good one. Anything else? Reliable, great reliability. What else might you put? What's that? Trusting. Trusting or trustworthy? A trustee, yeah. He's sacrificial because he's taking his own time to go and do this. I mean, there's a lot of things you could put in. Here's three I thought of to put in there. Competence. He's a man of great competence. You want to send somebody who's incompetent. You want to send somebody who's competent to get this done. That's a lot of traveling. That's a lot of time. Is this guy going to be able to do that? Can he find shelter? Can he find sustenance? Is he, is he going to travel some road or some way where he's going to get robbed and we're going to lose everything because this goofball put it in his hands and he doesn't know what he's doing. He's got to be competent. He's got to be trustworthy. And he's got to be a man of great faithfulness. Faithful to stick with it. When our daughter and her husband, little girl, lived in North Dakota, man, that's a long two-day trip to North Dakota, in a nice vehicle with air conditioning or heat, whichever you needed, traveling at none of your business miles per hour, <laughs> able to stop and get fuel and food or spend the night if we wanted to someplace. This is a couple of months or more on the road. No trip tick from AAA. You, you can't, okay, fine, here, where's the next McDonald's done? Oh, what's a McDonald's? Scotland hadn't even been invented yet. So how can you have McDonald's if there's no Scott? Anyway, see where I'm going with that? That's a reach. I know, but... <laughs> Why, had Scotland been invented? I guess there were some Scots up there, but anyway. So there we are. That's Epaphroditus. Now let's go to Epaphras. For the name Epaphras, same blank, blank guy, same derivation. That name comes from Aphrodite as well, but it's a 
a different guy. Not the same guy. Similar names. The readings. Colossians chapter 1, 3 to 8. Who will read that one? Any, any takers for Colossians 1, 3 to 8? All right, Jeannie, Jeannie will read it. And then uh, chapter 4, 10 to 13, who's got that one? Uh, Amy. And then Philemon, 23. Forgot to put the chapter down. Mike, all right. my fellow prisoner greets you with Mark the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision they have previously <coughs> offered to me. The Papyrus, who is one of you in a bond sermon of Christ, greets you always, laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has great zeal for you, and those are in La Laodia, mm -hmm. and those in Hyperop. <laughs> I'm not reading again. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great, Amy. Give her a hand. She's doing great. <laughs> and then Philemon 20. Oh, you're not finished yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, my. Is she done? Done? Yes. <laughs> Philemon 23. I'm, so uh, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you. That's good. That's, that's it. it. That's uh -huh. But it's enough. It gives us some insight here. All right. Number five. Epaphras or Epaphras. Epaphras, whatever you want to call him, is the one Paul credits with bringing the blank to the saints at Colossae. The gospel. He credits him with bringing the gospel there. Look at there, chapter 1 and verse 3. We give thanks to God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. See, Paul, I, I, there wasn't any punctuation in, in Greek as they wrote it out. And this may be just one of his famous long run-on sentences. But he finally gets down to the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world. Also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even at it, as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras. Finally gets down to it, but there it is. You read the whole context, you see he's talking about them receiving the gospel from Epaphras. That's, that's significant. And the one through whom, still in number five, the one through whom Paul has been blanked of their existence as a blank of the Lord's people. This you kind of have to read in a little bit. Paul has been informed of their existence as a blank of the Lord's people, a congregation, a church. They've been established. So what's different about this letter to the church at Colossae? Paul usually wrote to people he knew, congregations where he had either been or had established, but he has never been, as far as this seems to say, to Colossae. He's writing to a church that's been established by this one guy who took the gospel to them and taught them, and now they are a congregation of the Lord's people, and Paul's writing back to them to say, wow, 
I've, I've heard about you guys and it does my heart good and I'm writing you a letter. All right, number six. Paul writes of Epaphras as being a blank of the church at Colossae, a member. He's a member of the church at Colossae, not just a missionary that went and taught him, but he's a member of the church, saying that he is always working for them in his prayers. It said laboring for you, but that's what labor is. It's work. He's, he's working for you. Think about that. You, you working for anybody right now? Oh, yeah, we're working for you. We're working in our prayers. We're praying for you. The apostle also credits him with having a deep concern for the saints at Colossae, but also for those in Amy. <laughs> Laodicea and Hierapolis. All right. Number seven. We're down to the end of the worksheet. Paul writes to and this is from the text Mike read, so he's writing to Philemon, that Epaphras is blanked with him. What is Epaphras in 23 of the letter to the Philemon? He's in prison. He's a fellow prisoner. So why in the world are we talking about these guys tonight? Does it do you any good to read about Epaphroditus and Epaphras? Give you any insight? What's that? They went to work. They did their job. What is Memorial Day for? Yeah, you have to think about it a little bit, but you know Memorial Day is for those who've lost their lives in defending our nation militarily. What is Veterans Day for? Veterans Day is for all the veterans who are still alive, whether they went to war or not. If they served in the military, we have a day to honor our veterans. When we read this, to me it's kind of like the, the same idea, but for the church, for the kingdom of God. This, this is a memorial. This is a credit to these men, to their work. This is an example to us. This is inspiring. We see what these guys did and how they put themselves out. They put themselves, literally put themselves at risk for the kingdom of God. I mean, think you're, you're Epaphroditus and you're sitting at home watching TV one night and you get a call from one of the elders that says, hey, we want you to go to Rome. Oh, man, that's a, that's a two-month or more trip. Yeah, I'm up for that. I'll go. What do you want me to do? Well, we want you to carry some money to him because we need to support him financially. And, and you're thinking, well, wait a minute, a lot of money? Me on the road for two months with a lot of money? That's kind of risky, isn't it? Uh, okay, yeah, I'll do that. Put me down. And that's what he did. And in the process, what happened to him? He got sick. You ever been away from home and get sick? That can be pretty, it's miserable enough when you're home, but if you're away from home in the first century and you get sick, and how sick? He nearly died. We are standing on the shoulders of all those who've gone before us, of men and women who have served God Almighty in his kingdom in ways like these guys. These are men whose names we happen to know because they were written into these letters. But there are countless multitudes of saints through the years who have served in the kingdom to the effect that you and I can stand here tonight having heard the gospel because the church is still alive and working and the gospel is still being preached. We're not just talking about stuff that happened a couple thousand years ago. Oh, yeah, nice, nice history lesson. No. This ought to give us a sense of, of gratitude for all those who have gone before us, who have preached and taken the gospel. And, I mean, you think about... Epaphras, if he hadn't taken the gospel to Colossae, we wouldn't have the letter to the church at Colossae. And if you, if you read through that letter and you take stock of all the great teaching that Paul has given the church there, that wouldn't be in print, at least not as it is there, if he hadn't done that work. 
but he did the work. There was a hand in the back. Oh, Preston? Read in Philippians, I think it's verse 20, they're talking about Timoth Timotheus or Timothy. And you were talking about these three men that we're talking about and, and the lessons to be learned. And I think about the passage, I guess, that hit me along the lines of what you're talking about was verse 20. For I have no man like minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things who are Jesus Christ. And man, that's such a powerful statement for Paul to say about Timothy. Right. And, and then it makes me think about am I seeking my own or seeking things for Jesus Christ? There's so a lot of things that you can you can read through. Not, rather than read them over, you read through them you, and you find out there's something here I need that gives me pause to think about. Paul? And then Mike? It's clear we all understand our, and are in agreement that we are to emulate Christ. To, he's, our, he's our model. But when I read all these stories, especially for Paul Mazzalongo, who's been taught from since I was a little kid about these characters, about these people, about all the things that they do, I would present the idea that a lot of these people are part of our identity. They shape right. who we are. They, we, we get a physical example through a story, through a letter, through fill in the blank, whatever is presented to us in the gospel of what people, how God used people, and in many cases, the first time around, the first century church, the first people on the planet, the first, the first one. So I see them very much as part of our identity. Who we are. That's an excellent point. And if you think about that, how many people can you recall, especially in the Gospels, and you, there may not even be a, a name recorded for them, like the blind man in John chapter 9. Been blind all his life, and Jesus gives him his sight back, and the next thing you see is this guy arguing with the Pharisees about the identity of Jesus, and he's got to be the son of God because I've got my sight, and who do you guys think you are? You've already asked me, and I've told you. If I tell you again, you're going to believe in him? It's like, whoa, you go, man, come on. And then you think about that, and you think that that kind of a spirit is, is what I need because I've give, been given my sight back too. Not the physical. I've never had a, an eye problem like here, but I've had an eye problem in here and an eye problem in here. And God helps us to see things more clearly. That's why Jesus talked about you know, your, your eye. If your eye is clear, your whole body will be well. And here we're talking about guys whose, whose eyes were clear enough to put themselves out and, and make sacrifices that would challenge any of us, I think. And by reading about them and studying about them, we get some uh, inkling of that kind of character and integrity and faithfulness and godliness and they're pursuing the kingdom and all of that comes back to, to feed our psyche and our soul. that Yeah, that's who I want to be. That's what I want to be like. And it's easy enough. I've done it for years. You just read over these guys. And, oh, yeah, uh, Epa, Epa, something. It might be the same guys, Epa, Fras, I, I don't No, no. It's just two different guys with two different distinct impacts in the kingdom. And when you start looking at them closely, you see the details uh, that, that are given and you're, you're inspired by it. I don't know how you could help but be inspired by, by things like this. So uh, that's, that's why I think it's worthy of studying these things. Inspired by a godly person that's following Jesus is like-minded with Jesus because of what, what we learn. You know, I, I was thinking that some of the funerals that I've been to and, and what was read about the person and the stories that were told, like Dave Roberts, some of the stories that were told about Dave, not, not to put him above anyone else, but just reference for reference. And, and I went to a funeral in Arkansas. My cousin, uh, Patsy Harbin, they lived in Prince of Texas. Now, Rocky and Patsy were married 50 years, and, and Rocky had been an a elder at a couple of different congregations. And just the stories that they told about his life and how he never said a bad word, how he said 
example in how he raised his family and how he influenced others around him. Just that power of Jesus in our lives and how we affect everyone around us is such a powerful thing, a godly thing. It really is. And when you read James, James, in the last chapter, he says this. He's talking about prayer, uh, but what he says has always made me think, wow. Uh, James chapter 5, we'll break into it at verse 15. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And then he starts talking about Elijah, and this is what he says about Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. No, hold on, wait a minute. You mean he wasn't somebody on a higher level than me? James says no. Elijah was a man like us. And what did Elijah do? He prayed. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain on the earth for three years and six months. What's James telling us? He's telling us pray because Elijah wasn't any better than you are, but God heard Elijah's prayer because he prayed earnestly, and I'm telling you to pray earnestly. I'm telling you that you're saved by faith back in chapter 2. Who was saved by faith back in chapter 2? One man who was the progenitor of the Hebrew race, and his name was? Abraham, and then who was the other one? Rahab the harlot. So, oh, same level? Yeah, same level. No, come on, same level, same level. Abraham and Rahab, both saved by faith. They had works that perfected their faith, but both of them were saved by faith. When you pray, Pray hard, pray earnestly, because I want to tell you about Elijah. Oh, yeah, Elijah, the great Elijah. No, Elijah, who was a man just like you. Epaphroditus was a man just like you. Epaphras was a man just like you. All these people we're reading about, they're people just like us. The same sins, the same weaknesses, the same inadequacies, the same uh, self-consciousnesses. These aren't super people. They're people just like us. And if you're ever confused, they were confused. You ever read the Gospels about those apostles? Those guys were goofballs. And I'd tell them that to their face if I could see them right now. You guys, you guys were goofballs. You know how many laughs I've had at you guys at your expense? Yeah, they were just people, just guys. But they committed to follow Jesus, and that's what made all the difference. And there's a lesson for us. That's what we have to do. Commit your life to the Lord. Follow him. It will make all the difference. And we will be people whose life will become lights, whose lives will become salt, whose lives will become like cities on hills that are visible for everyone to see and to set an example and to lead people to the Lord that we worship. Uh, that's, I guess that's a good place to end class. Anybody got anything? No, too late. The bell's rung. <laughs> Preston, what do you got? The, when you talk about light, I think about Saul and persecuting the church and putting people in prison and all of that. And all of a sudden, he becomes a Christian. He Just exactly like what you said, he becomes salt. He becomes light. Right. That's what we all do. Oh, my, hey, my, you had a comment. and I. You remember what it was? I'm only going to build on you talk to stand on the shoulders. Yes. And, uh, it's only because Epaphroditus' name is, is mentioned in the Bible that we know of. And there are so many that we don't know. Right. And uh, I, I was just going to mention that the preacher who baptized me, for example, uh, was a, uh, a guy who only spoke English, who came from uh, Florida. And he was an interior decorator. His father told him that he'd cut him out of the will if he didn't go to Sunset Bible College. So he went to Sunset Bible College. Then there was a church in Texas that decided to send money to establish 
New Testament church in French Quebec. I couldn't find the preacher to, to go, the missionary to go there. So this guy from Fort Walton Beach, Florida, who wanted to be an interior designer, who was forced to go to Sunset, who did not speak French. <laughs> he went to, to, you know, the church, the church in Texas said, okay, you, you've got the job. You, you couldn't get any job. And he was there, I don't know, four or five years, and uh, he never preached to more than 50 people. There was never more than 30 to 40 people ever in his whole career. Right. And he only baptized a few people, and he baptized me. And, and then he left preaching. He actually, his father died. Oh. <laughs> the, the, will was, uh, the will was taken care of. And, and he went into interior design. And uh, he only managed to baptize one or two people. And, but one of those people that he baptized went on to preach to a whole lot more than 50 people through this thing called the internet. Exactly. And I'm just saying. How many millions? Exactly. How, 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 and I, I'm not saying that to draw attention to myself. I'm, I'm just saying, imagine. In, in his wildest dreams, Jim Meadows was not, and he's passed away, but he, in his wildest dreams, he would never imagine the, the long-term effect that this decision made, you know, to go to a foreign country to preach the gospel to people who didn't even speak his language. Well, and Uvatan can work something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Took us the credit of the Denver Father. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's a fantastic I, I he hesitate to say story because that's a it's an interesting piece of history is what that is fascinating. I mean, if you want to you want to convert Nineveh, who are you going to send to Nineveh? Somebody who hates their yeah. Okay, you said it. I didn't <laughs> it's God is always doing things a little bit differently, but it always is the best. Thank you. Appreciate you guys so much.